So we're talking with Hal Herzog, who is a emeritus professor of psychology at Western Carolina University. And hello, Hal, and thanks for being with us. Oh, I'm happy to do it. And thanks for inviting me to do this today. And thanks for inviting me to the symposium. I think it's going to be unbelievably exciting. It's going to be quite interesting, I think, and uh, something I don't think has really been done before. So we're looking forward to it. And I should mention as well that you are the author of uh, this book, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, Why It's So Hard to Think Straight About Animals. And why is it so hard to think straight about animals? And <laughs> Well, the simple, the simple reason is that it's uh, hard to think about everything. But with animals, it's particularly, it's particularly hard. Uh, they play so many roles in our lives. Um, the uh, bottom line for me is that there's a couple of special factors that uh, come into play. And uh, one is that um, we have this sort of set of psychological mechanisms which come, you know, which enter into our thinking about animals. Uh, for example, um, we have biology, biological factors. So when we take a look at a puppy or a kitten or a creature with a you know, baby duck, or for me, even a baby garter snake, which I find absolutely adorable because they all have these great big eyes. And so we're sort of biologically programmed to sort of fall in love with creatures like that. However, culture also plays a huge role. And that's another factor, and one which I am in recent years become uh, more convinced is a role. So that puppy that's so cute in Kansas uh, doesn't seem so cute at all in Kuwait, where people are rare, rarely keep uh, dogs as pets. And it's in Korea, it's uh, seen as a potential meal. So that plays a role. Language plays a role. You know, we, we, one of the things that helps us avoid thinking about the moral implications of our diet is that we have words to dis disguise what we're actually eating. So we talk about beef rather than a hunk of cow. Uh, so there's factors like that. And then there's also uh, factors that pertain generally to human moral judgment. And my thinking has been very influenced by a psychologist named uh, John, Jonathan Haidt, uh, who argues that our uh, moral thinking is affected by two sort of conflicting mental processes. And one is uh, very rapid. It's controlled by emotion. And it's unconscious. And this is, the, you know, Hyde compares it to an elephant. And uh, what it does is we make these sort of split level, split second gut level decisions about whether something is right or wrong, especially, for example, when it comes to animals. Um, but, but then the second factor comes into play, which is just the opposite. It's, it's, it's rational. Uh, it's, it's, it's conscious, but it's slower. Uh, Hyde compares that to the rider on this more powerful emotional elephant. And uh, usually the elephant calls the shots and it's, it's, the, it's the rider's job, the, the second system's job to sort of make sense and rationalize emotional, uh, moral judgments that we've really basically made at an emotional level. So we have this conflict between uh, logic and emotion. And so, so as a result, this sort of, this sort of you know, mixed up, convoluted set of ethical ethics when it comes to thinking about animals. So what would be uh, an example of that, that kind of... Um where you have the elephants and you have the rider, as it were, and uh, yeah. and they're getting confused with each other. Yeah. Well, a good example. A good example would be uh, meat. And I, I think I think I think that's meat. Our relate our c conflicted uh, uh, relationships with meat is sort of where the rubber meets the road very often. Uh, and so people make people often make make completely irrational uh, judgments about about meat. So, for example, I remember. One time, uh, talking to a uh, there was a graduate student, uh, and I was sitting across from her at the lunch table in my department, and she was telling about how much she was how, how she was a vegetarian, and uh, she was eating a tuna fish sandwich as she was discussing her as she was discussing her vegetarianism, and um, so uh, you know, and to her that made sort of complete complete sense, but to me it was completely convoluted, and the thing is that she's not an exception. So there's been about three studies that have shown that about two thirds of vegetarian people that call think of themselves as vegetarians eat meat every day. What did what was her rationalization on that? Is it that fish aren't animals or, or what? I I, I I I have another friend who considers herself vegetarian, and she and she uh, eats fish and chicken, and she says, "Well, I don't eat anything with a face." Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> I didn't point out that chickens and fish have faces. Yes. <laughs> um, 
So let me just throw another one in here, which is uh, um, seriously puzzles me because I would love to have known what was going on in uh, this uh, young uh, lady's head who came to um, visit here at, uh, as you know, there was an animal sanctuary and she had spent uh, the whole um, afternoon looking after uh, the pot-bellied pigs, uh, taking them for walks and grooming them and and, she, and when we met her for uh, dinner at a restaurant in town uh, here, um, she just could not stop talking about this, this wonderful afternoon that she'd had with the pigs. Um, and then the uh, waitress comes along, hands out the menus, and she immediately goes for the pork chop. What's going on there? Um, what's what's going on there is uh, is called the meat paradox. It's mm -hmm. actually got a name, and uh, it's the it's the paradox that it's, it's beautifully uh, exemplified by the uh, poster that you sometimes see in animal rights circles that say, "Why why love one and eat the other?" And there'll be a, a picture of a of a dog, maybe a Labrador retriever, and a, a calf. And it's really a great question because, uh, you know, why, how, how is it that we can eat one and out the other? And uh, the, the reason we can do this, well, there's a couple of reasons we can do this. Uh, one is that we uh, compartmentalize and we have categories that we put different animals in. And so dog goes in, in our culture, dog goes into the pet category. Increasingly, we, we are considering those as members of the family. So to eat one would be akin to cannibalism. Um, on the other hand, cows are in the or in the or in, or in the food category, but the other thing is, if you were to, you know, you know, this was a. Did you did you ask her about that? Did you? No, I, that? I I didn't ask, and <laughs> I completely get the um the the dog cow thing yeah. as you put it. But here yeah. we're talking about the pig pig thing. This is yeah. she spent the afternoon with the pigs. Yes, and then I mean so, it would be sort of the equivalent of looking after the dogs. Uh, having a wonderful time with the puppies or whatever, going out to dinner and ordering sure. uh, some nice roast dog. That that's correct. So so let's so let's frame it a little differently. Let's ask the question: uh, What was going through her mind? Right. And uh, I would say nothing was going through her mind. That it probably it didn't even occur to her. It didn't even occur to her um, um, that what was going on. Now my my sense is that she was showing a little bit of ethical obliviousness. <laughs> because she was having dinner with you. And if I was having dinner with you, even though I'm a meat eater, I'm a meat eater, I would, I would, I would eat vegetarian simply because I've, you know, I've lots of friends that are vegetarians and I don't, I don't, I want to have a regular conversation. I don't want a hunk of flesh there between us being on the table. It's just, it's just, you know, I'm there to, I'm there to have dinner. So I don't, I don't want that to be an issue, but she was oblivious to that fact. And it did, it probably did color in some ways your uh, dinner because that you knew that that, well, that there was how weird how weird that was. Um, but let's let's say let's say that you had pushed her on that. Let's say you had uh, said, uh, well, how can you justify this? Um, my guess is she could have come up with some justifications and uh, it wouldn't be justifications that you or I would find convincing. Like one of the things that she might say, which mediators commonly say, is that, well, it's, humans are natural mediators. Uh, she might say this is part of our, you know, this is this is part of our biology. She might say you need, you know, we meet, we need the proteins in meat, which you know, we know is not true, but it's still a rationalization. She might say that if she has certain religious views, she might say, well, uh, God put, uh, you know, when, when God created the earth, He gave uh, humans dominion over the animals. Uh, she might say that, well, yeah, I am troubled by that, and I do some things to sort of to sort of help with that. She, she might say. Well, I only eat uh, pork that I know is is humanely raised, or I only buy pork that that's humanely humanely raised. Um, so my guess is she could come up with something. Um, you, of course, if you wanted to, could uh, refute correctly all these all these arguments, but you probably wouldn't convince her that she should stop eating meat. Well, to be quite honest, I wouldn't. I mean, the reason I didn't ask is that my sense was it would have been extremely embarrassing. She had been embarrassed, yeah, yeah. and you're absolutely right that it, she, it really, she just wasn't thinking about it at all. Well, she, let's, let's put it a little differently. She is like 98% of 
Americans, 98% of Americans, 98% of Americans, give or take a percent or two, eat animals. And the number of the the number of, of people that are true vegetarians and vegans is is surprisingly small. Most people are most people don't realize how small that proportion is because you see a lot of stories about you know increasing vegetarianism and ve veganism, uh, you know, on television and the news. But the fact is that we're uh, Americans eat more meat than almost any any place else on earth, and that has not changed far since the publication of Animal Liberation in 19 in 1975. Our per capita consumption has actually gone up considerably since then. We kill three times as more animals now as we did in, when Peter Singer wrote Animal Liberation for our dining pleasure. So she's not the exception. She's the rule. You have a great example of this in your book, and it's one that, that it's the one I kind of quote most often when I'm, I'm talking with people about it, and it's uh, about um, how much we disapprove of, for example, cockfighting. And you actually went to a uh, cockfight in, while you were researching the book. Uh, you know, I had a stereotype of what cockfighters would be like, and it was, you know, you know, psychosexual sadists, you know, brutes and all that. No, they were just regular people living in this community and it, it sort of support, you know, supported this, this, this culture. They were, they were conservative. They tended to vote Republican. They had, they went to church on Sunday. They were just like, uh, everybody else are completely normal, except for this one weird little thing that they, that, that they, that they had going. Um, they also, and, and the other thing that I realized at one point, I remember it just struck me, is that th they all had moral justifications for rooster fighting. In fact, they had thought about um, the ethics of their relationships with chickens vastly more than almost anybody else that I knew, including me. And, it, and so their justifications were, of course, just, you know, nutty. But others sort of hit home to me. And at one point, I realized that my justification for eating chickens wasn't that much different than their justification for fighting them. And uh, then I began, when I was writing my book, I actually began to look into the uh, how chickens are treated in, uh, in factory farms, especially broiler, ch broil broiler chickens. And what I realized that if I were to come back in the ne next life as a chicken, I would much rather be an East Tennessee Gamecock that I would be a, a chicken destined for you know to become a McNugget. They live uh, they're you know they're treated amazingly well during their long life, two years compared to six weeks for a broiler chicken. Um, they're given uh, you know you know you know, you know they're, they 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 they're, they're not pinned in these uh, you know awful uh, industrial uh, warehouses with where there's thirty thousand animals jammed into this ammonia filled environment. Their even their death is better. Than the death of a of a of a broiler a broiler chicken. So, um, I guess, I, I, you know, I'm. By the way, I just want to make it absolutely clear: I'm not supporting cockfighting. I don't want to see it made legal. I'm glad that it's now illegal everywhere, and and it's dying out as a as a blood sport. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's uh, there's a certain amount of hypocrisy. On the one hand, uh, you know, ex expressing such moral outrage at rooster fighting. At the same time, you're, you know, eating eating a McNugget. It's been, I guess, three years probably since the book was published, or, mm -hmm. or more. And I'm wondering if you've had any um, new insights, thoughts, whatever, since then. The we were talking about paradoxes. To me, one of the one of the one of the craziest paradoxes. Which I still can't wrap my head around when it comes to human animal interaction is the uh, Nazi animal protection movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have a culture where mass insanity sweeps across a nation. Um, so they're killing huge numbers of people, genocide, putting people in ovens. At the same time, you have a significant portion of the you know, hierarchy of the Nazi party that had an animal protectionist agenda. And so the, the, and enacted a bunch of legislation, pro-animal legislation, for example, the restrictions on animal research, banning of hunting uh, with dogs, uh, the guidelines for the use of animals in motion pictures, and a Humane Slaughter Act. And so in 1942, the Nazis banned the Jews from keeping pets. And so they rounded up the pets of the Jews and they killed them. 
But they killed him according to the dictates of the Nazi Humane Slaughter Act. At the same time, they were, the Jews themselves were not being killed according to the Humane Slaughter Act. And, you know, to me, that's, you know, of all the, you know, one of the things that, that you asked me about is sort of what are the sort of paradoxes in our thinking and why is it so hard to think straight about animals? I, I still can't get my head around that. And to me, that's that's scary because it shows the degree to which humans are capable. Our, our very malleability, um, the very things that makes us um, uh, decide that maybe we shouldn't be eating animals is and, and have that spread across the culture is the same malleability that can, under the right circumstances, produce that kind of behavior in the Nazi regime. Yeah, that leads me into wanting to ask you about one other thing that I actually read about just a couple of days ago. And uh, um, it was that uh, lawmakers in Kentucky are pondering a bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know this. Uh, that would make it a crime to have sex with a dog or cat, but not with other animals. And the quote um, it was in the um, <laughs> Kentucky New Era. Here. It says that uh, um, so-and-so of Kentucky Citizens Against Animal Abuse and Domestic Violence, who drafted the bill, said the omission in part is designed to avoid antagonizing hunters and farmers. And I'm, I'm not sure what... What do you make of that? Well, uh, if I was a farmer, I, I think I would be. I think I would be insulted by that, or a hunter. Um, I, I, I'm stunned by that, but I don't make anything of it. Okay, yeah, I do make. I do make one thing of it, and that has to do with the often arbitrary decisions that we make about animals. And I, I uh, when I read that, when you sent it to me, um, what it reminded me of was the bill passed by Congress, which says that mice, rats, and birds are not animals. Mm -hmm. And um, what this means, and oh, mice of the genus moose. So if you're a mouse of the, and by the way, this has to do with whether or not you're covered by the Animal Protection Act. So if you're a mouse of the genus paramiscus, a deer mouse, and somebody wants to use you uh, in some observational study in a lab, you're covered by the Animal Welfare Act. You've got to go through an animal care committee if somebody wants to use you in this research. But if you're a regular lab mouse, um, you're not covered by you're not covered by the Animal Welfare Act, nor are birds. So, uh, so to me, this, this this thing where dogs and cats, dogs and you know, it's 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 it's, it's going to be illegal to have sex with dogs and cats, but not with any other animal. To me, that's s sort of on par with the uh, arbitrary, arbitrary, uh, you know, rule in Congress that rats, mice, and birds are not animals. So that's what it made me think about. It shows that, that we have this, this ability to, to, to make these, to make these completely arbitrary distinctions. Just finally back to pets for a moment and uh, what it is uh, about them or what we tell ourselves about them uh, yeah. that makes them so different in just so many ways. I mean, things that, uh, you know, if you do to a dog, you can be locked up for almost for life, but uh, you can do to all sorts of other kinds of animals. And um, we, we've changed the way that we've that we thought about pets. So, for example, take the idea of unconditional love. And, uh, you know, if you ask someone, uh, uh, why do you know, why do humans keep keep pets? Very often people will say, well, they provide us with unconventional, uh, I mean, unconditional love. And I, I think whenever that happens, people are really thinking about dogs. And so pets are often synonymous with dogs sort of in our heads. And so and I used to I am a dog person, but I haven't had a dog for a number of years since our kids since our kids left. And now I've got a cat and my cat, Tilly, um, she does not provide me with unconditional love. I provide it's her with unconditional that, exactly. love. You know, <laughs> I provide her. So this yeah. unconditional love idea. Oh, we, you know, animals are, you know, animal. We have animals in our life because they provide un, 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 you know, unconditional love. I, I don't really buy. I don't really buy that at all. And by the way, the most common pet in the United States is not a dog or a cat. It's fit. It's a fish. 
there are more fish living in human homes than there are vastly more fish living in human homes than there are dogs or cats. And the, the other thing is, I, I think somebody, somebody asked me recently, what's, what's our situation with pets going to be like in 100 years? And uh, probably some viewers won't like this, but, but I, you know, I, I, I thought about it for a second. I thought, you know, it might be possible that we won't have pets in 100 years, that we will have come to the conclusion that pet keeping is unethical. Uh, and I've recently read a wonderful book by Jessica Pierce, the philosopher and pet lover, uh, Run Spot Run, where she makes a strong case uh, pointing out the, uh, the uh, ethical problems associating with us keeping an animal in captivity because it brings us pleasure and us controlling every aspect of its life and us doing things like denying it certain natural behaviors like uh, cutting off their uh, reproductive glands because we don't want them to have offspring or making uh, making them stay in the giant house, the giant cage that we call our house because we don't want them to go outside and do what they really like to do, which is kill little things. So, so you know, to me, it's quite possible. 100 years is a long time and, and times change in 100 years. And to me, it might be quite possible that we will look back and we will say, you know, I can't believe we, we, we imprisoned these animals. <laughs> And we might have we might have uh, you know robotic pets that are that uh, sort of fulfill the same fulfill the same needs. And they give us plenty of un unconditional love <laughs> in some wonderful digital fashion. <laughs> yes, I think I think it's I think it's possible. Hal Herzog, thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks at the upcoming symposium. I am very much looking forward to it. It's been great to talk with you again. Great. Always a pleasure. <laughs>